Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's webinar. Uh, I am AJ Kuftik. I'm a digital product strategist with Expedient. Uh, today with me, I have Eric Beiersdorfer. He is our senior engineer on our product operations team. And today we're going to talk about our brand new cloud file storage platform. Uh, a quick uh, housekeeping note. Uh, please enter all those questions down here into the Q&A panel, somewhere around here. I always go the wrong way. Uh, enter those questions down in the Q&A panel. That helps us keep track of them, make sure that they get answered. If you ask a question, you're entered to win a prize. That prize today is a $100 Best Buy gift card. And all of this is being recorded. So if you have to step away, you want to show this to somebody else, uh, you'll get a link uh, to the recording in your email afterwards, or you can go to our website, go.expedient.com slash webinar replays, youtube.com slash expedient, instagram.com slash underscore expedient, and linkedin.com slash expedient. Also, hey, everybody watching on LinkedIn Live, I hope you're having a great day today. Also, give us a, a follow and a subscribe on all those channels. Thanks. Uh, we've evolved, though, over the last 20 years. Uh, we started in 2001 as a co-location provider. Today, we have 12 data centers in eight cities. In 2007, we released our virtual co-location product that allowed us to be able to provide virtual hosting to our customers before virtualization really took off. We want to be on the front line of technology. In 2015, we released our push button DR platform to provide disaster recovery as a service and fix the problems with disaster recovery, and that includes full network failover. In 2018, we've we announced and released our enterprise cloud that provides an evolution to our virtual hosting that has a full cloud operating model for all your VMware workloads without all the refactoring. It just makes it simpler. And last year, we released our cloud native platform to provide a platform for your next generation applications with full cloud native storage, managed Kubernetes, and observability. And this year, we've been focused very, very heavily on multi-cloud because we see this as the next step in the evolution. But one of the big things that we find is that data is important. It's a big deal for our customers to understand where their data is, right? You can move all your applications out to AWS, Azure, GCP, us, but if the data is sitting on-prem or it's not where it needs to be, you could run into a lot of problems because data is heavy and moving it requires a lot of effort and it's a lot to deal with. So what we want to do is figure out ways to make it so that the data can be more available in more places. And when we as IT admins and engineers think about where our data lives, we usually think of block storage, right? This is where our VMs live. And inside of those VMs is where all of our data is. But if you talk to your end users, when you ask them, where's your data? They point to their file servers because that's where their data sits. And the problem is, is that file services are real hard. The biggest one is that storage growth and keeping up with all of that growth can be a massive challenge because your users are constantly adding more data. And then you have to back up all of that data. So your storage and your backups grows as well. And trying to keep up with all of that in a way that doesn't require you to go build gigantic, make gigantic CapEx purchases can be really, really hard. And then there's the challenge of high availability. And I just need to warn everyone, I'm about to show a graphic. This might hurt some souls or might bring up some really bad memories, but this is how we've done it in the past. This is DFS. You may remember it. I may be getting some shivers in the chat right now. Sorry. But this is how we tried to handle high availability. And all it does is it adds a ton of complexity on the back end for us as administrators and managers of these platforms to provide a semblance of high availability to our front end, to our end users. And finally, there's latency. As our workloads are starting to disperse into various cloud services, having low latency connectivity to the data is important, but if your data is all stuck in one place, it's hard to get there. And meeting, doing a bunch of replication to try and keep data in sync across all these platforms to bring that latency together can be really, really hard with the traditional techniques that we use today. So there has to be a better way. And so when we went back to the drawing board, we, we looked at the drawing board and at the top of it, it just says cloud different. And we had to think about how to do file different, how to do file services different. And we actually started with object, really. Uh, and the reason for this is that we wanted to be able to provide a scalable platform to meet the needs of our customers, no matter where they may be. And so as a, just a quick background on object storage, it's made for unstructured data. There's no file system. There's no management to it, right? 
It is where your things go. A Word document, a CAD file, a video are all just objects on top of the storage. That there's metadata and IDs that are used to index that so that the system can actually pull those files back. And you may have heard of it as its much more popular name, which is S3. So what we set out to do was to build an object storage platform that was S3 compatible, because as developers are building their next generation applications, they're utilizing the S3 language, the S3 syntax, to be able to drop their data where they needed to go. We wanted to meet those developer use cases where they were. So providing an S3 compatible object storage system was critical. And then we wanted to make it highly available and make it global. One of the big challenges with file services is that they're very much locked and siloed into what's being stored in each individual instance. What we wanted to do was remove that and make it so that there was one central book of truth that everything had smaller local access to. And so our object storage provides that capability. We have geographic availability for our object storage platform inside of our data center footprint. So what we set out to do was actually make S3, but better. We have API and GUI access just like S3 does, but we make it super easy for developers to use their exact same syntax to come in and drop their files in. You'll see that here in the demo. What we wanted to do was make it so that our object platform could meet the needs of our customers no matter where they were, but remove the egress and operations fees that come with S3 inside of AWS, right? There's the traditional egress fee of I'm pulling data out, I have to pay for the transit of that data. But there's also operations fees around puts and around lists. And so we wanted to remove all of those to make it a flat rate system for your developers and for your users. And then there's no storage tiering. It's just the good one. We put it all on our high performance SSD storage to make sure that your data is accessible as fast as possible. So by building this baseline foundation of object storage, we can layer file storage on top. Now, what does this do for us? This allows us to provide a global file system that grows with you. You can land your filers anywhere that you need them to be. That doesn't have to be in our cloud. That can be on-prem, that could be in AWS, that could be in Azure, and your files can land where they need to be to meet the needs of your end users because they're your files. And we want your files without all the headaches. We support SMB and NFS, so your Windows servers, your NFS servers can all access this platform without any issues. But the storage is almost customized because you don't have to think about your file server being this monolithic thing that lands at every single place and has to have room for all of the replication of every single piece of data that could live on that file system. If I have engineers at my manufacturing plant and I have accounting people at my headquarters, the engineering people only have their CAD drawings and their files that they access cache locally. Everything else lives back in our object store. The accounting people have all of their accounting data that's cached locally. So they have super fast access to that, but they don't have to keep all of the engineering data because they never use it. It makes it so that your cache is customized to your end users wherever they may put their filers. And it's also highly available and as highly available as you need it to be. You can deploy a single node for maybe a remote branch office, but you can also deploy multiple filers to provide high availability on the front end for you. And this connects back to our highly available object store. There's high availability built in at each layer all the way down. But that's really cool to talk about. Let's actually see it in action. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how we can actually utilize the object storage platform. So there's a nice interface that you can log into and upload files, but I really want to show you how the developers would get to it. So what we have here is a command line. Some of you may have seen one. And it starts by utilizing the AWS S3 CLI. This is the same one that you would use to connect to S3 inside of AWS. And all we're doing is doing the exact same commands, but pointing them at a different endpoint. So now that we've listed and seen that there's nothing in this inside this bucket, we're gonna copy this lovely image from our website up to that. Same commands, just a different endpoint. You can remove that endpoint URL and point it directly to AWS if you want to. Now we're going to change the ACL to make this a publicly available thing so we can actually get to it from a web browser. Set that endpoint URL. 
And now when we flip over to Safari, we can actually go pull up that file and see what we need to see. And there's our pretty picture, right? Super simple object storage so your developers can come in and get to what they need to get to. But let's really dive into this. So in here, this is our Expedia Enterprise Cloud. And inside of here, we have our 701 filer. I just deployed this this morning. So I have this, this is a virtual VM. It's an OVA file. You can download it from us if you want to deploy it on-prem. You can also deploy this inside of any other, I see a lot of raising of hands, only the demo slide. No one can see the demo. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. Hold on, we'll fix that. Thank you, chat. Sorry. So let's try that one again, huh? Is that better? Thanks, everybody. Sorry. So here's what we're using. We're utilizing the exact same AWS S3 command line, right? So we're just pointing at a different URL. The exact same command line set, everything works the same way. We copy our image up. And again, we're just changing the different endpoint. You remove that endpoint URL and you're just pointing to regular S3, exact same commands work. Makes it super simple. So we've copied the file. We're gonna set our ACL. I'm very glad I looked over and saw everybody raising their hands. I'm really sorry about that. Right, open up a web browser, put in the URL of the file, you can connect directly to it. This is a great opportunity for you to use this for things like CDNs. Um, you can utilize this for your developer applications, object storage for your cloud native, right? We have managed Kubernetes, you can do all of your puts into here as well. It's a super powerful platform. We're super excited to have it on board. But now we're back to where we were. So we have our 701 filer. I just deployed this this morning. We already have a filer in our ACM data center, but I just deployed this this morning. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to go configure this. I just need to make sure that I have a piece of information before I go fire anything. There we go. So we'll drop in our password. And we're setting up our new filer, right? This is what you would do if you were deploying this on-prem. You can connect this up just as easily as we can, right? So gateway, gateway name, 701-filer01. We're going to connect this to our backend portal. This is how you're able to deploy all of your filers wherever they need to be without the trouble of, if I could type, it'd be great. I can't share my screen correctly. Type correctly, we'd be, in, we'd be in business today. What we're doing is this allows us to access our file system wherever it needs to be, right? So we can sync this down, paste that in. We'll set our license on here and we're going to use this for caching. And I'm going to join this to my domain. So this is creating the computer account and allowing me to pull in all of my AD credentials that I could use. So things like domain user groups, uh, all logged in users, those sorts of things, you have AD integration here. So we'll just go ahead and let's hope I type my password correctly. Big bucks, no whammies, nailed it. So now I have my gateway here and I can go in and I can set up my shares. I can see that I have a good connection to my domain. And I'm gonna go delete my default share because I don't need that. And we're going to edit this share. We'll set this to Windows ACL emulation mode. We'll disable caching. Next, change my groups. Admins. Users. We'll remove everyone. That way now only my people can get to it, right? So now I'm done. I just set up this filer with all of its shares. I can also create a new share. So I can drive into here and I can say, I want to share out maybe this applications folder. We'll just change this to applications. 
next. Um, same sharing setup. Helps to pick the groups. And admins, users. And so now I've created this new share. I come down here, I have my, let's get one more window open. I didn't open a new window because it wasn't up yet. So 701 filer 01, I can see my shares here. So I can open up this application share. Helps to just move the one window, right? I have not copied any data. All of this is being synced and it makes it super easy. And if I copy any of these other files that are too big, let's see if I have anything smaller, we'll copy this, sh this shortcut. If I copy this one to here, the sync happens on the back end, and my file will be available shortly. Actually, it may not because it's a shortcut. Oh, there it goes. So all of this is being synced on the back end, so I have everything there. Note that the icon isn't there yet. That's because it's not caching that locally yet. It just sees that the file is available. If I double click on it, it reaches out and actually grabs the icon and grabs the shortcut and opens it correctly. It makes it super easy for me to keep my files in sync no matter where they are. I deployed this across our two data centers. I could deploy this into multiple clouds, and it just makes it simple. What we wanted to build was a file system that could meet your needs wherever your needs may be, right? We can make it available where you need it, deploy it on-prem, deploy it into any cloud, and it makes it easy for everyone. So what's next? You can go out to our website, expedient.com slash services slash assessments, and you can get sign up for a free assessment on where to land your cloud workloads. You can also go to expedient.com slash services slash multi-cloud, and you can see our full multi-cloud vision. And with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. Eric is out there. I'm guessing a bunch of these uh, questions are based on not being able to see anything. Oh, no, great. Awesome. So, Eric, I feel flustered. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I'm Come good. I've been answering some of them as I can, and uh, some of them are a little bit more uh, detailed so we can talk through them. So, you know, there's a question on, do we offer any type of file locking? Um, so if this is in reference to, you know, locking a file when multiple users access, yes, file locking is supported on the local gateway. Um, and then I also answered another similar question around snapshotting. So if you're also referring to snapshots, snapshots are included um, and allow you to easily roll back to previous versions of the file. Um, there's a question. Run through these answered questions because one of the things that not everybody can see all the questions. So I just want to run through the answered ones, just make sure that we're all, that everybody's clear so we don't do anything here. So we have what kind of encryption is used? Uh, we have data encrypted with a AES-256, that's at rest in and transit. Um, the, do we have AI capabilities embedded to increase performance? Uh, we use a least recently used algorithm in the platform uh, to populate the cache with the optimal data. So that it makes sure that it's just looking to see what data is hot and what's not. And if it's not, it, it removes it from the cache but it keeps up with it as it goes along. Um, the cloud file storage uses our object storage, which is geodiverse across three sites. Um, so that's our way of providing the, the object storage. The filers can land wherever they need to, but the object store is inside of our platform. Uh, if you have a traditional Windows file server, would this replace that? Yes. Um, you can use this to replace your file servers and eliminate all of the Windows patching that goes along with that. Um, you mentioned the snapshots. Uh, so we're good to go there. Man, yeah. there's, a, there's a question surrounding which OS does this support. So, uh, you know, the, the filer will support um, anything that speaks SMB and NFS, as AJ previously mentioned. The, the devices themselves are actually just OVAs, which get deployed into your environment. So there's nothing for you to, to manage there on an OS level. There's also um, Amazon AMIs and Azure ARM templates available too. So you can deploy that wherever you need to go. Makes it simple. Uh, we talked about file locking yep. already. Are uh, you, where, are, where are our data centers? Uh, you can go to expedient.com slash data centers. You can see all of them. You can even take virtual tours of them because there's like a global pandemic happening. Um, but there's uh, we have two data centers in Pittsburgh, two data centers in Cleveland, two in Columbus. We have two in Baltimore, one in Boston, one in Indy, one in Memphis, and one in Phoenix. Uh, so we cover the U.S., 
Uh, you can access these from anywhere as well. This isn't just inside of our four walls. The object platform lives inside there, but it can be accessed from anywhere. There's a good question regarding how this is built. So it's a uh, flat rate dollar per terabyte model um, that allows you to consume up to the amount that you have purchased. Uh, no hidden fees and no overages. Like that. Um, let's see here. Of those items that interface with objects, does Expedient Solutions manage these interfaces the same way, manage the briefly explain the differences? So what we have is an object platform. All of those things that are in there, so ID, metadata, attributes, those are all part of the objects on the platform. You can utilize the GUI to get to those files. You can utilize APIs and CLIs uh, to get there. So it makes it easy for us to be able to provide that object storage platform and it to, be to be consistent with many of the other object storage platforms that are on the market to make it so that you can utilize this platform or others as part of your developer processes, right? In your CICD pipelines, the way that you're connecting to those things to maybe write or do puts of your objects, you can use those. Uh, there's a question, are you able to support or enhance DLP policies? Uh, currently not. Uh, that is a feature that we are uh, having our roadmap though and are looking to offer in the future. Uh, I, I see a question here about file encryption. Uh, everything's encrypted at rest. So you don't have to worry about your files being uh, encrypted inside of the platform. All of that is encrypted as part of the file systems, as part of the filers, as part of the storage. So there's a number of levels of encryptions on the way down. There's also another question, is the web interface available to see files within? Yes, you can log into what Satara calls your portal and um, you can see all the files that are located in your global file system. In fact, hold on. So this is the actual global portal. So you can see all of your filers. This is the one that I just deployed uh, this morning. Here's the one that we deployed yesterday. Uh, you can see your users and your shared items all the way through. Um, you can actually dive in and see your files in here as well. So there's another global option for you to access them, not just in the Windows File Explorer. I just expect a lot of users to be connecting with Windows File Explorer, uh, but there are other ways to do that. You can create NFS mounts as well. So if you have servers who wanna use that, you can see how that's all pushed in. Uh, so there's a question on alerts and growth projections. So we will notify you when you've reached 90% of your utilization. Um, that way we can address the situation. Either data can be cleaned up or we can expand the storage. Um, you will also receive a monthly report that details the last 30 days of your usage and gives you a nice chart um, to help you predict future capacity needs. Um, can you, are there immutable storage options too? So we, our, our backup system is immutable. That allows us to do things like protect against ransomware attacks. Um, so if you're, if you're looking for immutable storage, that would be the way to go do that. Uh, and that's part of our uh, cloud archive storage. So we can do that as a different way of storing that data. Um, in this instance, this is, this is specifically for use of your end users who will likely not want their files to be immutable. They would like to change those. Uh, because it's part of their jobs. But in terms of you know immutable storage, we can definitely talk about other ways to do that or what sort of use case you're looking for in terms of immutable storage. There's a question on caching. Um, so the caching is a local SSD that's attached to the OVA, which provides you know performant access uh, on the local network where the filer is deployed. Uh, da, 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 da. Just wanna make sure. Is there a recommended bandwidth for a good experience? Uh, so this is one of those it depends uh, kind of answers. Uh, you know, obviously anything that is local is going to be out of cache. Um, what will rely on your internet connection is writes and reads out of cache. Um, and, and caching can be sized appropriately if there's a limited bandwidth at your location. Uh, can you have hybrid user logins authentication to simultaneously support both AD users and expedient native user accounts? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we prefer that people use AD for these sorts of things because it's part of their lifecycle management will likely be end users, but you can also create service accounts if you want to, uh, to make it easier for your applications to use those. Um, but yeah, we, we recommend AD, but we also support non AD accounts. There's a question here. Can you directly access the data in the cloud via SMB without the local filer? Uh, no, you need the local filer to facilitate the access uh, over the SMB and NFS protocols. Yeah, 
you can still go out to the, the portal itself and go dive into your own file structure like I am right now. Here's a department structure. Um, this is how you would actually go do it. This is very much like a Google Drive, OneDrive scenario, right? I think one of the key things here is that this is different from OneDrive and Google Drive. Um, we use OneDrive internally, so we're fairly familiar with how OneDrive can be a bit of a challenge from time to time, not particularly because I think the OneDrive is bad. I actually quite like it, but it makes it hard for department shares. There is definitely different models for doing that. This is a way for you to maintain those existing department shares that take away all of the patching and all of the headaches that go along with that and let a fully managed solution take care of that for you and give you the performance you need for your end users. Uh, so there's a question on how this compares to Azure File Services and its sync and cache ca capabilities. So, you know, this should be thought of as more traditional uh, file share, um, you know, SMB and NFS, and it uses intelligent, um, least recently used algorithms to ensure that the most populated data or most useful data is populated into your cache. So I think... We are kind of coming up here on time. We can get a couple more questions in here. Um, but as, as, you know, as part of this, this is definitely growing. Um, and we expect this platform to grow. Uh, and it's something that we think is going to be a big solution for a lot of customers and where they need to land their workloads. Uh, can you clarify in the model how the OVA is required to facilitate functions? So it is in essence what's running, I mean, it's a Linux appliance running SMB and NFS, and that provides the ability to have that protocol running SMB over the internet, running NFS over the internet, not really such a great idea. So this allows for the traditional file access without having to have things go across the internet to get to uh, our, our platform on the back end. It just makes it simpler. There's a question, is there a charge for the local filer? Um, is it available? Oh, sorry, another question. <laughs> um, there's no charge for the local filer. It is a bring your own resources model. Um, you, you do need to have the, the virtual hardware to deploy it on, but you can deploy as many filers as, as you would like against your, uh, your utilization. Is there a locally installed app for Windows that can map a drive eliminating the filer for remote access users? Um, if they're inside of your network, you could still use this like a traditional file server where maybe your remote users that are all working from home could still connect to through VPN. You could do it that way. Um, but mapping drives that way, even OneDrive and Google Drive don't do that. They have a sync tool that lives locally on the machine um, and then syncs down data from the cloud service. So mapping drives over the internet is not a recommended way to do file storage. Um, there are other ways to do that. And I think if we could talk a little bit more about the remote access user things, you can reach out to me, aj.cuftick at expedient.com or go to our Let's Talk page and we can sit down and really go through this use case with you because it seems like a pretty particular one, but we want to make sure that we get all of the, uh, all of the details on that. So I think there's a question here is how does this differ from more traditional NAS systems that, that we may currently offer? Um, and the large magic here is that, you know, the, the filer appliance brings the data locally to you. Um, no longer is the, the filer required to be deployed within a data center and traffic to be routed across the WAN. We can now land these appliances locally to your data sets um, and ensuring speedy access uh, and, and avoiding you know, traveling data across the WAN for SMB and NFS. And I'm gonna go ahead and answer the final question here with what are your future plans? And to find out, you'll have to keep watching these webinars. <laughs> we have a lot more coming this year. I, it's, it, I'm so excited. Uh, this is, we've done a number of big releases already, our multi-cloud firewall, multi-cloud or our cloud file storage and cloud object storage. We have so much more coming this year. Uh, I'm very, very excited uh, for everyone to get to find out about this. Um, but please uh, reach out to me, aj.kuftik at expedient.com. Um, you can reach out. I see a couple other questions that just popped in here. Um, yeah, we can answer some of these questions offline, um, but I want to thank everybody for joining us this week. Uh, reach out to me, aj.kuftik at expedient.com, or you can go to uh, our Let's Talk link at the top of our website, expedient.com, and we can get the details out to you.
Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week where we're talking about how to optimize your cloud costs, which should be a very fun, which should be a pretty fun session. Join us then. AJ, the winner. Oh, thanks, voice from above. Uh, the winner of the prize is Donna Morell. Thanks, Donna, for submitting a question. We appreciate that. So the $100 Best Buy gift card goes out to you. Karen will be reaching out to you shortly. Uh, and we thank everybody for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thanks.